Do we? Okay. We okay. Good. Good morning. Happy Friday. Um, my name is Phyllis Newbill. I am the associate director of educational networks here at ICAT. I'm so glad you're here for this morning's ICAT play date. A couple of housekeeping things. We are filming this morning in 360. Hello to our friends online. Everybody wave. They can see you too. This will exist online and um, the recording is in 360, so behave accordingly in the room. Uh, there should be a sign-in sheet in the room or out by the donuts. That's how we justify buying donuts each week, so please make sure you sign in. Let us know that you are here. Um, if you have questions, there'll be a time, plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. If you're online, there's a link for the questions, uh, either in the caption or on the screen that you're on. Um, I hope that you'll submit your questions and comments uh, there. Uh, if you have questions in the room, let me get to you with the mic before you start talking so that the folks online can hear you. If you are here for, prof well, I know you're not here for, but if it is helpful to you to have professional development credit um, for faculty, uh, there is a link for that today. If you're online and um, hoping for a professional development credit, if you would drop me a line either in the questions or you can send me an email if that's easier. Uh, just let me know that you're here so that we can give you credit. A couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we're back from Accelerate, so yay, that's, we checked that one off. Uh, we had a great time. I hope that you will see, um, check out the hashtag Accelerate Festival to see the pictures from the weekend. Um, everyone at ICAT is still a little bit in recovery, but we had a great time at the Smithsonian last weekend. Um, coming up, because we did not get enough of creativity and innovation, we want to see more, um, we have ICAT Creativity and Innovation Day here at Virginia Tech on Monday, May 2nd. Hope that you all will be here. That's mostly in the Moss Art Center. There's a few things happening over at the Creativity and Innovation District's Living Learning Community. We, somebody please donate money. That name is entirely <laughs> too long. Um, so that is happening on May 2nd. You can check out the ICAT webpage for more details on that. Um, also tonight, um, Open at the Source is our uh, annual exhibit in the uh, galleries here at the Moss Art Center. So we have an opening reception tonight from 5 to 7. There are drinks and hors d'oeuvres available for free. And I hope that you will be here to see the amazing work that is in the galleries today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our director, Ben Knapp, who has today's um, play date, Liminal Spaces, an exploration of integral spatial experiences. Also, the matrix, there is, yeah, this keeps going on and off. Oh, is it really? There's yeah. still a glitch? Is yeah, there a black a cat that walks through it? There's, through yeah, it? twice. Okay. Okay. All right, that happens. Yeah, I apologize if that's flickering on and off. We, we haven't seemed to have been able to debug that. Um, so welcome this morning. Yeah, a lot of us are in a haze right now from um, recovering from Accelerate. So I appreciate all of you here today. Um, we're going to do um, a brief presentation. Um, it's going to be me um, and my partner in crime for the past 13 years or so, um, Eric Lyon, who's a composer. Um, and these are the people that have all been working on the project. Um, David Franisic will be talking at the end some about some of the visuals he's working on. And Larkin might be coming. Um, uh, Larkin might be coming, otherwise you're gonna see me flail and talk about drones in a way that I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so, uh, let's get started. Um, one of my interests, probably my whole life, but certainly um, for a very long time, um, has been um, in the space between, to quote Dave Matthews, um, is this liminal space. And one of my first interests was really in the space between when you're trying to control a musical instrument. So um, that diagram that you see in the middle was actually put out in 1990, so that's 32 years ago-ish, um, which was a, um, me basically saying there's a traditional physical interface to a musical instrument. Um, there are ways that we can control the instrument by um, doing gestures that control that instrument but still in direct contact with the instrument, all the way up to we could control that instrument in spaces between us and the instrument itself. We can control that instrument 
through our affect, through our emotion, through the interplay that we have with the sound that's created from the instrument and the feelings that we get from it. And we can dance in that kind of liminal space. Uh, the, that's uh, Biomese Trio on the left when we were touring in New York uh, with Eric and myself and Gassia Zunian. She was playing traditional instrumentation. She was playing a violin. Um, Eric was um, really working with a meta instrument, which was the computer, and I was exploring that space between uh, with a, uh, brain waves and um, uh, muscle signals and stress and all sorts of stuff, like lots of stress, by the way. Um, the piece on the lower right was actually even before that, if I can find my cursor, um, see if that works. Do I have to be on that? Do I have to be up there? It does not seem to want to play. Um, it could also be the internet. Um, but either way, basically this was a piece um, that I composed and worked with a composer and performer on, a Tao Tanaka, where you were actually playing um, Tibetan bowls. Um, the idea was to play the Tibetan bowls physically, but then to walk away from the bowls and control them with gesture um, and, and moving through the space, so and moving back and forth through physical control, uh, emotional control, affective control, and gesture control. So that's sort of been my interest. Hopefully this will play. Yeah, this, this is a, um, a piece, and it's okay that the audio is not on, don't worry about it. Um, this was a piece that I did um, really, again, demonstrating those spaces between. Um, so th this was an audience um, watching this performer when he picks up that just a stick, but when he's actually has sensors underneath his jacket, when he gestures to play that instrument, sounds are created um, around the audience. So he's exploring um, physical control and control from just movement. And now we're back. Um, but the interesting thing about this piece, and the reason why I show it today, is it's a nice segue into another space between. So this audience was actually wearing earbuds at the same time. And the reason why they were wearing earbuds was because they, what they heard here um, was what he was actually hearing if he was walking through the woods. Um, so that's what they were hearing here. What they were hearing out here was live performance. There were in, um, performers underneath that grid playing. So they heard the performers out here, but they also heard him in here. And these were, there was this beginnings of what is this space between things that are out here being heard and things that are in here being heard. And so um, that's this piece that Eric and I um, and David and Tanner and others are working on, which is how can we, in this space that you're in right now, how can we explore the space between? Um, so you're in the cube, we've got 150 speakers out away from you. They form this beautiful dome around you. There are tricks that we can do um, in terms of the amplitudes of the sounds coming from the speakers to kind of mimic sounds moving in and out. But you know, a quote that Eric said, which I don't know where you got that quote from, but um, if you want a sound to come from here, you need to put a speaker there. Um, and so that, this is a beautiful array of speakers to make the sound encompass you that way, but it doesn't necessarily put the sound there. So the next layer of, of sound is really something that Tanner Up the Grove has been working on. Uh, which is something called the Tesseract, which um, originally the Avengers were going to use something that looked like that, but they decided that was too big for Loki to carry. Only a few people will ever get that, what I just said. But um, the idea with the Tesseract is that it's the cube in motion. Um, that is what a Tesseract is. It's a four-dimensional cube. But for us, and see, it's in motion right now, and it will reappear. Um, for us, the Tesseract is a layer of speakers around us, and where um, the Tesseract can fit about eight people inside it. Um, it's going to have 32 speakers around you. So now, if you're in the space, you've got sound here and sound out there. Um, so you've got two layers of sound. The third layer of sound I'd already just introduced you to, which is um, to wear headphones. But in between when I did that piece, way back when, and now, there's now commercially available bone conduction headphones. And the beauty of that is they don't block your ears. So back in that piece that you saw, the audience was wearing earbuds, that actually did affect the sound that they were hearing in the space. But now, with bone conduction earphones, it's right here. And um, Eric um, has a demo 
for, unfortunately not for you online, but for those that are here, um, you can hear a little bit of the original work, uh, initial work that he's doing with that that he'll talk about in a moment. Um, so you have now these layers of sound. You've got the sound right here, very intimate sound. You've got the next layer out, and then you have the cube. But the question is, um, what about the space between? Can we have sound that actually moves in and out? And so I came to Tanner um, probably about five years ago or so and said, could we do something, is it crazy to think of like doing something like drones? Could we use drones to move speakers around in the space between? Um, and so that's what we've been kind of looking at. And is Larkin here? Larkin is not here. Oh my gosh, I'm going to wing it. Um, so we have drones in the cube, which stars Samuel L. Jackson. Um, we have drones in the cube here um, that can carry a speaker payload to move the sound around. Um, we're also looking at other ways of moving a sound around, but um, this was the original conception. Um, one of the things is drones in this space don't have GPS, as you can imagine, so we had to um, uh, work with the motion capture system that's inside the cube here to help um, locate and help the drone move around. Um, drones are very loud, so compositionally we're having to think about what it means to overcome the loudness of the drones themselves. Um, we've also had problems, we've actually, cr we have video, or we don't have video, yes, we don't have video, unfortunately, of a drone crashing um, into the ceiling of the cube. Um, so it's a real challenge getting them to work in this space, but we promise that before any drones are actually used in a piece, we will make sure that it's all safe and good. Um, but we are actually buying a, getting an open source drone um, with open source software on it, using the motion capture system, and um, basically designing something from scratch on up for it to support this. And what's neat about that, and all of what you're hearing today, is you've got, um, an artist who's a technologist, a technologist who hopefully tries to be an artist sometimes. Um, you've got uh, folks in ECE who are experts in drones, um, all collaborating and working together. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a slide that I really, actually David, you could probably talk about a little more than I can, but um, uh, do you wanna give it a shot? Yeah. Uh, I can try. Uh <laughs> I don't know what the stuff on the left is, but ROS is a robot operating system that interfaces with Qualysys uh, Track Manager, which is the motion capture system um, in here. And so what the ECE folks have been working on is the control systems from the motion capture to the drone, and that's both error checking and localization like cycle of knowing where the drone is. So we actually had a problem where the drone, because they're GPS reliant, it was inside, didn't have GPS, and so it did its like base level thing, which was go to its home point, which is 30 meters above where it takes off, which if you look up here is a lot higher than the ceiling that we have in here, so that didn't end well. So <laughs> um, that line of uh, inquiry uh, using like sort of off the shelf drones with some modified parts didn't work, so that's what Ben was talking about with the open source drones where we can control every aspect um, of it. I think that that's close enough. I don't know what all those specific things are. <laughs> that's way better than I could do. Um, so yeah, so again, reminding you why we're doing this is to try to move sound in between the layers of the space. Can we move sound in and out? And as we said right at the first slide, can we move the sound in, out, through you, and back? So Eric, did you wanna kind of talk a little bit about the compositional aspects. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, Ben. Um, and so this is, as, as we know, a very, uh, very special space, and we spent um, many years exploring the expressive potential of sound that can, can move on, on this surface. And uh, we may actually have an example of this in a, in a moment, we'll see, see if that works. But what, what's really fascinating to us is to have an even broader range of intimacy from sounds that are, seem to be produced in your head, um, which is what the bone conduction does, to near field sound, to finally going to this much larger space. And so essentially, 
what we're doing compositionally is we're developing sound materials. And right now we really have just two sound materials. One is a text, which you can actually uh, see here. That was, uh, if, if, I, if I may reveal it, that, that text is by, uh, by Ben. And uh, we have a, a beautiful recording of it by uh, Natasha Staley, who's a professor in uh, the School of Performing Arts. Uh, and then we have a, a much more abstract uh, sound, which has many different elements. And uh, the idea is to move at least those two sounds through these different spaces, through bone conduction, near field, uh, tesseract configuration, and drone. So that, that will, and, and, and I should say drone and cube. So that, that is the plan. And if we have a moment, are we queued up here to play um, the sound? I wanna see if we can do that. Um, Let's, we'll press play, it'll either work or not. This, this, this is intended to be uh, an example of a sound that would exist on the cube itself. So let's see what happens. So you can kind of imagine this going on in, in this one space, and you could I hope you could hear a sense that this is not just moving around you, it's moving up. Uh, oh, you can stop that. Um, it's, not, it's not just moving around you, it's moving up, it's moving closer to you, it's moving further away. You also heard maybe some pitch glide here, which is intended actually to be ultimately coordinated with um, movement of the drones itself. So this, this sound is going to be in a lot of different places. And uh, that, that broadened uh, spatial and experiential uh, tapestry, um, or palette rather, is, is just really exciting to all of us. So the last thing we want to talk to you about, um, and David, I don't know if you can come up, um, is we'd like to have some visuals as well reflected in this. So I'd turn over to David to talk a little bit about that. So Ben and Eric have been talking about moving sound around in space, um, but how do you move visuals around in space? Um, over the past uh, few years in fits and starts, <laughs> uh, I've been working on a way to use the motion capture system to do dynamic projection mapping where uh, visuals will be glued to an object um, where you track both the projector and the object in space and the imagery stays glued to the object. So here you can just see some of the um, tests that I've done. And um, so you can imagine that maybe the drone is carrying some sort of projection surface um, and then it would be moving around the space and have an imagery attached to it. Um, in the fall, I worked with a CS a capstone class to actually start working on a calibration system for this um, dynamic projection mapping system. And uh, exciting to hopefully continue that work um, maybe in the fall semester or over the summer. So, um, And looking forward to working more with Ben and Eric now that there's like actual so solid things that where we can get our uh, teeth into as far as creating visuals. Yeah, that's basically it. I think the last thing I'd like to say is that, you know, in the in across the country, and at Virginia Tech, we one of the questions that's always asked is what is arts research, and to me this project is a wonderful example of arts research in that we don't know exactly where this is going to go. We don't know where this is going to land. We have ideas. Here's the first piece that we're trying to use um, to explore some of these spaces, both visually and orally. 
Um, and it'll be interesting to see where this lands and hopefully others will get a chance to use the infrastructure that we create through this piece um, for their own pieces going forward. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Phyllis, thanks. Thank you, Ben, and, uh, and team. Wow, uh, my mind, as usual, is blown. Um, David, this part where you're actually putting visuals, projection mapping on moving. Anyway, I'm still blown away by projection mapping on buildings, and now we're projection mapping onto moving things in the air. Jamie, you have a question. Can you say a little bit about the tesseract that's in the upper gallery? Um, yeah, that, absolutely. Well, I mean, actually, we have an expert here. Um, Tanner, do you want to talk more about it? Sure. Yes, the Tesseract in the upper gallery is a presentation of a multi-channel audio system. And the Tesseract, the idea is we're together in the cube right now with all these loudspeakers. It's really hard to take this cube other places. So we have this system which we can pack up and shipped to other places, including the upper gallery. So that's one representation of the Tesseract. It currently has 32 loudspeakers, and it's playing a variety of data sonifications uh, composed by Brandon Hale, who's also in the room. Thank you, Brandon. Right and it's really interesting. We're, we're playing a lot of different types of sound generated from EEG data, which is measurements of the brain. We're playing data from cybersecurity data sets. So if you have a few moments to go listen to it, Today, it'll be up and running. Did I answer your question? It seems like there's a lot of quiet space in between, so I don't know when to, I'd, I'd like to hear each of the pieces, but um, I'm, I'm wondering how it's set up in terms of, are the pieces random or how, how are they designed? What, what's the cycle of the five pieces? That's I'm going to bring another presenter to <laughs> unscheduled, Brandon. We try to get as many presenters as we can. Yeah, um, so I also want to mention that uh, Caleb Flood actually did half of the works on there. That's something that I think he should get credit for. And he helped me set up the, the, the Tesseract too. Um, so there are, I think, five pieces. Um, there's a 30 minute program, but between each piece there's a six minute pause to give time to the uh, TV speakers. Because there's, uh, there's other works being played on TVs with, with uh, just like stereo speakers. So uh, we wanted to make sure that they could be heard too. So there, and unfortunately you have to wait six minutes between each piece. So you have to kind of sit there for a whole hour to experience the whole uh, program. So yeah, you're welcome. But the beautiful thing about that is you get that, I mean the, the Tesseract was really conversations that we've had over the years of, um, well this is great. You have this incredible instrument that's known as the Cube at Virginia Tech but what if you want to do this kind of thing in other places and have people experience it? And so that was really the motivation for creating the Tesseract. And um, Tanner got a grant uh, from um, Cybersecurity Initiative in, in the state to listen to data and that enabled us to fund um, creating the Tesseract. So we have a question online. Tom Martin is sorry he cannot be with us this morning. If drones had been designed originally for this piece, rather than, I'm gonna maybe turn to David, um, designed for this piece rather than for taking pictures and dropping bombs, how would they be different? What um, are some issues with the drones that the team had to deal with besides them flying into the ceiling? Um, noise would probably be the main. Noise, the noise to payload <laughs> optimization problem, I think, is, where, is how you would design this because um, unfortunately we didn't have sound for that one drone video. They are very loud and the noise is not pleasant. Right, it's not a pleasant noise. It's very harsh. You're getting all these kind of discordant sounds. So I don't know what that means physically for the drone. Maybe larger propellers moving slower, um, so it's more of a whooshing, quieter sound that can carry a speaker um, rather than the super harsh. Like because it doesn't need to be agile for one thing. Um, the drones that we're using uh, would just need to move slowly. So it doesn't need to have super powerful motors that can change direction. Um, or doesn't need to be that responsive. So I think those are the things. Quieter, doesn't need to move fast, which can probably both um, 
feed off of each other because if something is just moving slowly, then it doesn't need to be uh, as Actually, loud. I can add a little bit to that, which is to say that the, the, um, the sound of the drone itself creates an, an aesthetic problem, which is how um, uh, it, you could say, okay, it's, it's noise, it's, it, it, it just ruins everything, but um, what the, the initial experiments that we've made are to actually use recordings of the drone and incorporate them into the piece in such a way that you would first hear uh, little bits of the drone in, in say, the, the bone conduction headphones, um, uh, then gravitating to the, um, um, to, to the test rack, and then finally, when the drone itself emerges, rather than being um, um, disruptive, it, it feels like it, it's, um, it's integrally part of the piece. So you're saying that you might even design the drone to make a certain noise. Is that what you're saying? You could incorporate it if you were designing it from scratch? Well, that would be fun, of course. I mean, uh, you know, it'd be, it, it would be to play the ride of the Valkyrie, right? Right. Um, but, but no, I mean, the sound, the sound of the drone, it's, and, and actually, there, there is a precedent. There's a, um, I believe it's 1965, a uh, composition by Gordon Muma called the Dresden Interleaf, and it actually, um, it, it's a kind of commemoration of the Dresden bombing, and he used, Gordon used, um, model airplane planes with very loud motors um, that appear about halfway into the piece, um, which is very loud, very intense, uh, but, but just aesthetically perfect for what the piece is going to do. Our, our aesthetic intention and, and narrative are, of the piece is kind of in, in, in completely unrelated, but it, the piece does demonstrate that you can use pretty much any sound um, and especially sounds that, that have been associated with just like disruption and noise and actually um, make them really beautiful. And if I can get the, give the boring nerd um, answer to Tom's question, um, it's actually a power ratio issue as well because we don't, we don't need the drone. And the piece that we're working on, it's gonna be at most 15 minutes. The drone is gonna fly at most five minutes. So we don't need the big, huge battery pack that the drone is vaulting up, we just need a speaker. So um, Tom teaches cl uh, students all the time about power and power efficiency and stuff. So that's another piece of it as well. So many things to think about. My mind is going in a hundred different directions. What other questions do we have in the room or oh, online? Tanner said he can play the drone sound. Oh yeah, play it, go ahead. We want to hear the